I'm delighted to be here. My name is Tricia Rose. I'm the director for the Center for the Study of Race and Ethnicity in America, which is the, which is the English for that acronym called CSREA. And I'm delighted to be here, and I'm thrilled that you all are here. Many of you are either graduating, yay, or your family is here to celebrate your graduating, and they're like, phew, uh, and yay. Um, and welcome back, undergrads who are here just through graduation as well. So we have an action-packed presentation, Sam Rosen and I do, this morning. So I'm going to try to move as quickly as possible and to leave some time for conversation. Please come sit anywhere you want. There's seats and, you know, no problem. I want to let you know before I get into the meat of the project, uh, that's the title of our research, what our mission is at CSREA because this project that we're going to share is really a great example of what we try to do. And that is to be a campus-wide hub that supports and generates rigorous and accessible research, performance, art, and scholarship on a broad range of pressing issues related to race and ethnicity to help build greater understanding and a more just world. And we have a reception. I always forget to tell people, so I had to put it on the slide this year. Um, we have a reception at 96 Waterman Street. This is basically when you walk out of this building, you make a right, and it's across the street after the pathway on the, uh, the green pathway. So please come join us. I think it'll be about 10 to 11.45. But the meat of our talk today is a brief presentation of a research project that I've been working on for a few years uh, on my own and also with Sam Rosen, who is a uh, Brown 2014 graduate. And we've been working together on this in a variety of capacities. It's a, an unwieldy project in many ways. So we're still chugging along. Um, but Sam did a fantastic uh, thesis on colorblindness and racial ideology, uh, which won a number of awards in the Africana Studies concentration. And so we had been talking about that first, and then I'd been talking about some other aspects, and so it was sort of like peanut butter and chocolate, and uh, we've been working together ever since. So let me tell you what the broader project is about. Basically, it's a project that tries to connect five key areas of society where systemic discrimination is highly dy dynamic and consequential. And in particular, we're focusing on housing, education, media, wealth and jobs, and criminal justice. So this, there's a tremendous amount of research on these areas. We're not here to reinvent that wheel. What we're interested in is creating a public-facing, accessible prod product to help everyday people grasp what's really going on, not only in the research, but also in society. And the other... Um, significant contribution is that we're trying to explain the importance of discriminatory forces that create these things we call racial disparities. If you pay attention to the media, you'll see there's a tremendous amount of information about what's going on. This, this level of racial disparity, that level here, whether it's education, housing, you know, dropout rate, et cetera, et cetera. But the question is, what explains it? The question isn't, are the numbers real? The question is, what are the reasons for these disparities? And so our project is trying to make a very specific argument about um, how the policies and actions, past and present, connected to ideas and beliefs, actually create much of this disparity. So when we win some money or someone gives us a lot of money, we will create <laughs> accessible digital educational explainer videos breaking this project into small pieces with curriculum, maybe some podcasts, to make it a, an everyday accessible project. That's what we're up to. So let's do some defining, because there's nothing uh, more important than knowing what we're talking about. What is systemic racism? And, and we began this project with the word structural. And if we had an hour and a half, I'd spend 10 minutes explaining the shift but we don't, so you're welcome to ask me afterwards at any time. But, um, all right, here, are, uh, is there a thing, Blink? Oh, here we go, right? Okay, systemic racism in the US, what is it? It's the normalization and legitimization of an array of dynamics, historical, cultural, institutional, and interpersonal, that routinely advantage whites while producing cumulative and chronic adverse outcomes for people of color. Now, again, if I had a lot of time, I wanna leave half of my time here for Sam to drill down on the, from the big project into a very specific analysis of how Trayvon Martin's entire conflict and confrontation with 
George Zimmerman was actually not a personal exchange, but a systemic racism produced exchange. In order to get to that, I don't have a lot of time, but I want to highlight a few words. Critical is normalization. It's not a one-off process. It's not individual bigotry. Legitimization is that a set of policies, practices, and institutional um, behaviors are legitimated. Um, and they happen routinely, right? It's not exceptional. These are not those moments that where something unusual happens. It's sort of just the way it is. And that actually makes it much harder to pay attention to in a certain way, much harder to be outraged about because it's normalized. And it's framed and reframed in ways that render it invisible. And um, cumulative and chronic is extremely important because you can never really talk about uh, you know, housing discrimination in 2018 and talk about it in isolation. You've got to look at least 50 to 75 years back to make any sense of what we're actually seeing. And so, uh, and those things that we'll see in those moments really make a profound uh, difference and impact. So this is a working definition of systemic racism. One of the things that's very important about disparity analysis, which I'm not using that word, and I'm putting it in quotes a little bit grumpily, <laughs> disparity analysis. You know what I mean? It's like, what does that mean? Um, the problem with that is that it doesn't acknowledge that this is part of a system as a whole. We usually think about discrimination as a single sphere problem, and I'll explain that in a minute. But our argument is that it's part of a discrimination system and that things that happen in one area are interdependent to things that happen in another. It's interactive and it's compounding. And it works across institutions and social spheres. And I'm going to show you an example in a minute. But before we do, what is a discrimination system? It's a set of dynamically related subsystems in which disparities systematically favor certain groups, disparities across areas are mutually reinforcing, and one source of the disparities is discrimination. That's very important. This is um, from a, a major sociologist. This is important because we, we like to think it's either all or nothing. It's either always discrimination. Every act has to be discriminatory, or it's just not a discriminatory system. But in fact, you can have non-discriminatory factors going on in a discriminatory system that can routinely produce the kinds of outcomes that we're seeing. So this is important because it's not an all or nothing scenario. So these are the five areas we're, we're looking at. Um, and in everyday analysis, usually you'll see tons of work, in journalism, long form, news based, as well as research that focuses on one area or another. Because of course, each one of these areas is vast. If you were looking at housing and race in America, you could spend your whole career doing just that. You could do this with each of these, right? And what happens is you end up saying, how do we explain educational disparity? Why are black and Latinx youth dropping out at higher rates? Well, what are the test score gaps about? What are the criminal justice concerns, right, in this gear? And so what happens is we do a single sphere analysis and we're not interested in thinking, what is the cultural, social, and political ecology that is happening in these five critical areas? How do they work together? Okay, that's what a systemic analysis emphasizes. It's more interested in connecting these gears than it is in actually seeing them in isolation. Anyone who has children, many of you in this room do, otherwise you wouldn't be sitting here in Providence on this lovely morning, you know full well how important education is connected to where people live, how, what kind of criminal justice relationships are happening in those communities, the media and what, you're, what we consume and representation and ideas, et cetera, and so on. So I could spend time, I'm going to skip this part because I'm, I know you all know that there are extraordinary disparities in wealth and criminal justice. I'm going to just breeze through this and spend a little more time on the next slide. Um, but the one thing here that's really important is to just know that the black-white wealth gap and Latinx white gap is also big but not quite this big but, but close, is now roughly $11,000 to $142,000. Um, and if you control for gender, and you actually make it uh, black women and white women, that number of 11K drops to zero for black women, and is at about 110 uh, for white women. So gender plays a really interesting role, which is important for particularly single family households. Hey, Carmen. Um, 
So the wealth gap is going to come up later and be important. We've heard a lot about criminal justice. I assume if you come out early in the morning to a, title, a project titled Systemic Racism, I don't need to tell you about the criminal justice system, but we know. But I want to talk about this because this is going to play a role uh, in, our, in our rethinking about Trayvon. Um, the school to prison pipeline has been a pretty extraordinary process by which things that are going on in one gear are actually fueling and transforming what's going on in another. So to create a kind of body of criminals, really, um, there's been a, a really differential, racially differential basis for punishment in schools, all the way down to preschool, which I find pretty stunning, right? <coughs> Black children represent, this is the Department of Education, which you know is not exactly a sort of left-wing think tank, so, okay. Um, so that means the numbers are, might actually be a little bit worse. But anyway, represents 18% of preschool enrollment, but 48% of preschool children received more than one out of school suspension. In comparison to white students, represent 43% of preschool enrollment, but 26% of preschool white children received more than one out of school. To, uh, suspension. Now, I have to ask the question what a preschooler did to get suspended because I'm just wondering were they just having a tantrum? Like, what, what exactly could be going on? How, how can a four year old, and when I think about it, I'm like, is there some way we can intervene yet? Have we already given him over to the system? I'm like four years old. Anyway, I mean, it's half joking, half, you know, incredulous, but this is an important context for thinking about what schools are doing, how they play a role. And these are not just in segregated schools, but integrated schools, which is also an important factor. So two things to keep in mind that are very important. Um, one is that systemic racism can go on without anyone having any direct awareness of its goings on. Personal prejudice, people usually know when, what that is when they see it. But systemic racism largely works because it's rendered invisible through a variety of normalized practices. That's why normalization was such an important part of the definition. Um, and so it's fueled by ideas and stereotypes as well as institutional practices. The practices institutionally are actually explained by stereotypes. So we'll say things like black kids are unruly so we have to suspend the four-year-olds, right? So you have to have a justification for a differential treatment. That justification uh, is happening at the role of ideas and stereotypes. And so the, these ideas about race and racial stereotypes are extremely important because we don't have to have explicit intentions. You can simply have a belief system. Um, and that's very important because people get defensive if you tell them this sometimes, this kind of information, and they'll basically defend it with an argument about the behavior of the individuals because they're not necessarily understanding themselves as participating and supporting a system like this. And these ideas and stereotypes hide systemic racism right in front of us. One idea, actually there are two key ideas, and I'm, I don't have a lot of time, so I'm, again, I'm racing because I really want to make sure we get to, to Sam's presentation. And this is a very um, challenging thing to hear at a university, right, that I'm calling meritocracy a myth. And people, how could that be? We're at Brown. I mean, goodness, we're all, our kids are great. Your children are much smarter than the professors here. No offense to my colleagues. None of us would probably have gotten into Brown if we were going today. I, I certainly feel that way. Um, but that doesn't mean people aren't talented, that doesn't mean people didn't work hard, but the system is not a meritocratic system because the resources and access to, to circumstances are simply not adequately fair enough to generate meritocratic outcomes. But once we have a discourse that shows that we've overcome any kind of racism because the way we think about racism is through the Jim Crow era of the South, because we beat Jim Crow, because forced required segregation is over, because the laws require equality theoretically, then what we have is a meritocratic system. I mean, this is obviously not true, but we, we function as if it is true. And in so doing, it really produces a lot of resentment when you talk about systemic practices, because it looks like we're saying, I don't deserve what I got. If you're saying there isn't a meritocratic system, then you're saying my success isn't, isn't valued and isn't worthy. And that's not true. It's just to say some have tailwinds to make our success and hard work matter, and some have headwinds, which often reduce the value of what we have. 
So what explains deep inequality if there are no systemic impediments? Why do we have such a disparate outcome? And what we end up with is behavior. And this activates a tremendous set of stereotypes and bias. And I'm just going to give you know, some brief examples. Um, oh, wait, I think I took those out because it was taking too long. Yeah, yeah, yeah. OK. Yeah, I was like, I don't have time for that. <laughs> um, <laughs> there's a meme version of that, but we'll leave that alone right now. Um, so in particular, when you think about the, the well of stereotypes and bias that get activated, in particular, the association of black and brown youth with crime generates a profound level of fear and drives perception in a profound way. We're seeing this more and more in the public realm right now, but it is a long-standing kind of uh, conscious stereotype and unconscious bias which fuels these various practices. Um, this is going to come up in another context, too, but the, the constant overestimating of the actual shares of burglaries, illegal drug sales, and juvenile crime committed, at least on average by 20 to 30 percent. And that's in direct question studies, which usually has a reduced uh, outcome. And the pattern is also confirmed in implicit bias, which is different than explicit bias. Media crime coverage reinforces this. There's a tremendous amount of work that shows how crimes are covered how racialized groups are covered in certain types of crimes, how different types of crimes, white collar crimes, are covered with a level of equanimity, even if the harm is to thousands and thousands of people. Um, and then there's the cultural arena, right? Which is that if the criminal, criminal characters and behavior are almost always um, ha involving African American culture and actually reinforces this association. It also justifies draconian policing policies and extreme responses. When you think about the Starbucks incident in Philadelphia recently, you have to ask yourself what drove her to call the police within two minutes. Now, it could be just personal racism, but that seems too simple because you have to have a whole set of factors in play for that even to make sense in the first place. One of them is implicit bias for sure. There's also conscious stereotype. And then there's physical segregation, right, which drives the context. So it creates a, a setting of reasonable responses, right? And it racial, racializes those reasonable responses. Um, and when you look at these things again together, it fuels the targeting of African Americans and other people of color. So here's a quick example of how this works. Unemployment rates, again, Census Bureau data, broken down 2010, a pretty much two to one, and that's pretty consistent across time and decade. Sometimes these numbers go down, sometimes they go up, but it's usually twice as many. So then the question is, why are twice as many African Americans unemployed? How can that be? There are two basic explanations. And if, if you pay attention, you'll hear this one over and over again. I'll never forget, this is a long time ago, but when Ronald Reagan was president, which just shows to go you, I've been around the block a minute, he opened up a newspaper at a press conference and said, I've circled all the jobs that are available. There are all these jobs. People should just go get jobs. They obviously don't want them. I thought he opened up the newspaper and circled some jobs. And, and obviously, there was this underlying assumption that people who don't work don't want to work. Now, of course, there's some people who truly don't want to work. This I will say, you know, if they can work. But that's not a racial phenomenon. That's a human phenomenon. Um, <laughs> A systemic analysis points to how, how hiring discrimination happens, the, the truncated access to opportunities, and the role of social networks. Something like 90% of all jobs are filled by people who the people who are hiring know or who they know they know. So it's a complete social network scenario. And um, where, what, why that matters is white social networks are 1% African American on average. So we're, so we're not just talking about housing. We're not just talking about schools. We're talking about, do you know Joe? Joe would be great for this job. Who's Joe going to be? 1% chance in social networks for opportunity. I'm not even counting discrimination. I could do a whole talk on that. And I could talk about the physical inaccessibility to opportunities. Um, but I want to talk specifically about housing as our example. I mean, our purpose here was to show these two types of approaches and how they play out in obscuring systemic racism.
But in housing in particular, I want to talk about how the significant role of not just forced segregation, but the incentives to segregate produce a whole arrangement of opportunities and tracks for access and lack of access. And so, um, as we'll see when we move to the discussion of Trayvon Martin, um, this, the role of spatialized racial expectations, where people belong, where they don't belong, and when they're out of place, what does that mean about how we perceive their behavior and their actions? And what investments do people have when the people who are out of place are out of place? In what way does that threaten a sense of comfort uh, that's going on? So one of our projects is to look at these various kinds of factors in the broad sense and then see how they're playing out in a series of case studies. But I'm going to focus in, just before I move forward, I'm going to focus in on redlining. There are many, many, many historical pra and recent practices. Um, these would be, this would be the one good thing up here, but what the real news is that there's no money to make it enforceable, pretty much. The rest of these things, and this is very powerful now, one of my fantastic graduating PhD students did an incredible thesis on Brooklyn, which is you know, ground zero for gentrification. Um, but basically what we're looking at is a series of practices, institutional policies, and behaviors that have created not only profound segregation, but lack of opportunity and access. So let's spend a minute on redlining. How many of you know the basics of redlining? Oh, great, so I'll just whiz right on by this, fantastic. I mean, you never know. Some people do and some people don't. Okay, redlining, what is it? Okay, it's a process that was developed by the federal government in, in cahoots, cal you know, collaboration with a corporation that they set up called the Homeowners Loan Corporation that worked with real estate uh, professionals and banks to rate neighborhoods based on a color-coded scheme and use that rating, which was color-coded based on race, in order to determine whether or not loans would be extended, and if those loans were extended, what the interest rates would be. That is, this was a risk assessment color-coded system. It happened in every major city and small town in the United States. Legally, for this period, 1930s to 1977, but the consequences of it are profoundly living with us today. Um, most importantly, when you look at the color-coded system, you have Green is for A, which is an in-demand neighborhood, which isn't just because the houses are nice and have leafy trees in a park or because it's walking distance to a Starbucks, but because it's white, period. It was oper operationalization of the financial value of racial category. This is a profound, a profound impact on, on our cities and towns. Blue is mostly white. Yellow is subversive racial elements, which is you know, also racist. I mean, because I'm sure this was you know, well, never mind, I don't have time for that. Okay, uh, I'll let you just figure that out as, you know, follow that thread. Red was the worst rating, that's why we're talking about redlining. Redlining, worst rating, D, no lending at all. That means for homes and businesses in those neighborhoods. Neighborhoods where any black people, even one lived, were marked in red, given the lowest rating and ruled completely ineligible for home or business loans. This is Boston in the 40s, I believe. I can't, I can't recall the exact, it's, I think it's the 40s. And this just gives you an example of what this was about. Now, this means this is something you have to be very worried about. If you're, you're in a position of decline everywhere along this line, and these are often tremendous conflict zones historically, Right? It's also the police get activated to control these boundaries because it's literally a property value matter. So fragility becomes a very important racialized category here. Fragility around uh, whether or not one's neighborhood could turn to black, which is pretty much, in this point, any black people at all. Um, and, and there are tremendous effects. And I want, this is where I want, because you all know what redlining is, we don't need to go into how its evolution was, but there are a number of profound impacts. The first one is that it chokes off the value of any investing in black communities um, by black people or anybody else that, that, um, that wants to. It suppresses the value of property simply based on who's in it. 
and there's a tremendous, uh, even there's an entry in the notes, because there's notes for the, all that whole period of properties and addresses, and they say, this neighborhood is a well-kept, middle-class black neighborhood. We're giving it a high red. I'm like, I'm like oh, okay, so how's that differ, difference from a low red? No, not really any different. <laughs> it's pretty much the same, but we just want to acknowledge that they're doing a nice job. So what happens is they create ghettos. It literally produces ghettoization. It, it sanctions and, and makes the value of not just black neighborhoods, but it devalues them, which creates ghettoized conditions. It reinforces, it creates poverty itself because there's no intergenerational wealth creation that's much very possible. And it reinforces associations of black people with poverty and struggling communities because the assets of its residents become significantly important for political leverage, for social services, uh, and for the kinds of capital that we use to keep our houses and communities uh, spiffy. It also, and this is you know, unpleasant, I know, but it artificially raised up the value of white neighborhoods. It gave them a higher market value, which gets, uh, fuels educational inequality and segregation. Why? Because we pay for education through property taxes. I mean, it's literally a set-aside. So once you have redlining going on for the vast majority of the 20th century, now you have what? You have situations where tax bases are protected for public schools, and if you don't want to send your kids to public school, you have additional resources and capital to send them to private schools. That is, that's a racialized system. Again, we all want our neighborhoods to be safe and wonderful. I'm not saying people are individually thinking this way, but this is what the system generates. It increases the wealth and assets. We, you saw the wealth gap that we talked about. That gap is largely due to home ownership. The, most Americans, except for the very wealthy, have only their homes as their asset for wealth. And uh, that's important for safety nets. That's important for intergenerational wealth. Um, you, you think about all the things you use things beside your income for, for health, uh, unexpected health crises that stabilize the family, for educational needs et cetera, and so on, for, for giving your children, when they have children, nanny coverage and care beyond what their jobs can, uh, can help them afford. But it also financially rationalizes white protectionism so that it protects the notion of racialized neighborhoods being safe and profitable. It makes black fear or fear of black people financially reasonable and it stigmatizes and devalues diverse neighborhoods, no matter how safe, friendly, or stable. There's some interesting ways gentrification is changing this particular thing for now, but we'll have to see how it ends up turning out to know what, what that's really gonna look like. But it fuels self-segregation and white flight. So what you have is a gap. You have well-meaning, many well-meaning people who believe in integration, who want equal access for all, but the system is set up where they'd have to literally turn over assets in order to live up to their values. I don't know who we think people are, but I don't know if I would do it. I mean, I go, here, here's some assets. Be like, uh, I don't really think so. We'll work this out in the next generation. I mean, that's really hard to imagine people doing. I think we have to be honest. It's not about imbuing, you know, saying people are immoral and unfair. It's not that simple. But we have to acknowledge this system for it to make sense. I think I'm going the wrong direction. Um, so, okay, so we've talked about, yeah, I'm going the wrong way, okay. So, um, oh, and this one, I didn't quite get this one right on the formatting, sorry about that. Um, but this is important again for Trayvon, I'm about to turn this over to Sam, but basically the process of segregation is something that happens over and over again. It's a continual process, it's not permanent. So as neighborhoods become multiracial, the process of white flight happens, and then it happens again, and then it happens again, and then urban renewal and gentrification happens. So there's an ongoing process. But what Massey and Denton's amazing book called American Apartheid shows is that there's a tipping point for comfort, racially speaking. At least, you know, I can't say today, this is maybe 10 years old or so, but it's, it probably is not likely to be that different. There's a 20% racial tipping point for whites. It initiates white flight. Less than 20% black whites will move into a neighborhood. More than 20% black whites stop moving into a neighborhood. More than 30% black whites leave, basically, is what this says. I can't read it from here, but that's what it says. Um, and so what happens is, once you operationalize racialized segregated logic, 
um, then you're, you're creating a process that reproduces itself over and over again. You don't have to have institutional processes that deal with this. So you can't make sense of wealth inequality. You can't make sense of educational inequality. You can't make sense of the way that black and brown working class and poor communities are criminalized and policed because of the way they're segregated. Right? You can't make sense of that unless you think about housing. And then, of course, we have the news coverage and the media coverage of all of this that really facilitates our conceptual understanding. So a systemic racist analysis, racism analysis helps us understand how personal behavior and individual beliefs do not have to drive an unjust system, and that our work has to be less about how we're personally feeling and much more about what we're willing to operationalize. And so I end with one question, which is, what's all this got to do with Trayvon Martin? Sam Rosen's going to let you know. Thank you very much. Thanks, everyone. Um, and thank you, uh, Professor Rose. So um, Professor Rose just gave uh, an overview of the theoretical framework for our project. And what I'm going to do now is show how systemic racism works in the context of a life and in a community. So for this, we've chosen a well-known case, the story of Trayvon Martin. So let's uh, briefly review what happened. Trayvon Martin was a black 17-year-old who was killed by a man named George Zimmerman on a Sunday night in February of 2012 while walking back from his father's house in Florida. Trayvon's death and Zimmerman's murder trial both received extensive media attention, most of which centered around Zimmerman's possible motivations and Trayvon's character. Most media focused on the micro details to explain what happened, instead of focusing on any of the larger systemic forces that set the stage for this tragedy. Behind me is a cover that People Magazine ran after Trayvon's death, and I want to direct your attention to the subtitle in the bottom left, which we've reprinted next to the cover. It reads, quote, an unarmed 17-year-old is killed in a Florida neighborhood, how a chance encounter turned deadly, leaving a family devastated and a country outraged. Now, that caption may seem totally innocuous to you, but we actually think that it's hugely significant because it captures the core framing, the nearly universal common sense thinking about this case and recent others like it. People Magazine called the confrontation between Trayvon Martin and George Zimmerman a chance encounter. And in some ways, this is true. But on another level, the encounter wasn't random at all. What I want to illuminate for you today is that despite widespread media framing that suggested otherwise, the deadly encounter between Trayvon and Zimmerman was significantly shaped by systemic racism. I want to talk in particular about how systemic racism and the ideas about black people that justify it shaped their encounter in three key areas, in housing, in criminal justice, and in schools. In each of these areas, evidence of systemic racism was largely ignored or misinterpreted through the lens of racial stereotypes and individual behavior. And I also want to show that the factors that shape Trayvon Martin's life and death are by no means specific only to him or, his, or to his community. They are instead key components of how systemic racism works in the United States. Trayvon was shot while walking back to his father's girlfriend's home at the retreat at Twin Lakes, a lower middle class gated community in Sanford, Florida. Zimmerman lived at Twin Lakes, and he was the captain of the community's neighborhood watch program. So what kind of neighborhood was Zimmerman watching, and why was he watching it? Sanford is a city of about 50,000 in northern Florida, about 30 minutes from Orlando. Both the city of Sanford and the retreat at Twin Lakes are fairly diverse places. Sanford is about 60% white and 30% black, and Twin Lakes is about 50% white 20% Latinx, and 20% black. And Sanford has a median household income of about $38,000. So we're talking about a lower middle class area, which is significant in part because Twin Lakes was built as an aspirational luxury oasis. These are still frames from a promotional video for Twin Lakes. This secluded, gated community, the video says, is like living in a resort the perfect choice for those looking for space 
and comfort. In 2004, when Twin Lakes was built, a 1,400 square foot townhouse there went for $250,000. But in retrospect, 2004 was part of what we would now call the housing bubble and was a very bad time to build a gated community of aspirational luxury townhouses. A few years later, the Great Recession hit, the housing market collapsed, and many residents, as well as new investors in Twin Lakes, started renting their properties to cover their mortgages. By 2012, in a pattern that repeated itself around the country, the same townhouse that was worth $250,000 eight years earlier was now worth under $100,000. So in 2012, the retreat at Twin Lakes was a community on an emotional edge, but it was also on another kind of edge. In her presentation, Professor Rose explained that due to whites' negative racial perceptions of black people, whites stop moving into a neighborhood once it's above 20% black and will move out of neighborhoods that are over 30% black. So the retreat at Twin Lakes, which is 20% black, and located in Sanford, which is 30% black, sat right on the threshold where whites have decided a neighborhood is becoming too black or not white enough. And this racial tipping point, as you recall, has economic consequences. Because of the higher market value attached to white neighborhoods, white flight accelerates declines in property value, which in turn leads to more white flight. White flight stems in part from whites unfounded yet widespread hyper associations with black people as criminals. And Twin Lakes demonstrated this ideology in textbook fashion. In the 14 months before Zimmerman killed Trayvon Martin, there were an estimated 45 burglaries or attempted burglaries at Twin Lakes. Reuters reported that of those 45, only three were known to be carried out or attempted by black men. In the summer of 2011, the summer before Zimmerman killed Trayvon Martin, there was a small wave of burglaries at Twin Lakes, including a particularly well-publicized one where a mother and her child had to lock themselves in a room while two burglars ransacked their home. Without any statistical evidence to back up their claims, residents talking to reporters in the aftermath of the killing of Trayvon Martin described a community besieged by black criminals. One neighbor said, quote, there were black boys robbing houses in the neighborhood. That's why George was suspicious of Trayvon Martin. Another resident told a different reporter that neighborhood burglaries were being committed primarily by, quote, young black males. In the fall of 2011, Twin Lakes decided to form a neighborhood watch, and George Zimmerman volunteered to be the captain. In many ways, though, Zimmerman had already long been the unofficial watchdog of this gated community. He moved into Twin Lakes in 2009, and in the two plus years between when he moved in and when he killed Trayvon, Zimmerman called the police incessantly to report all sorts of things. But during the summer of 2011, the focus of Zimmerman's calls to police narrowed significantly. Specifically, the Tampa Bay Times reported he started to fixate on black men he thought looked suspicious. Often this was reported as an individual fixation of Zimmerman's, and it may really have been one, but Zimmerman's behavior embodied an irrational racial paranoia that appeared to be widespread at Twin Lakes. So you have a neighborhood which has been made fragile by the financial housing sector, and one that is made additionally fragile because of the market penalties attached to a diverse neighborhood, sitting right on what, for whites, is the crucial 20% tipping point, a point that activates white racial anxiety. And in Zimmerman, you have a resident who has been operationalizing this racial anxiety, who also has an intimate knowledge of the racial dimensions of housing values thanks to a career spent in real estate and working at a mortgage agency, who then volunteers to be the captain of the neighborhood watch and sees a black teenager walking through the gated community alone on a Sunday night. Zimmerman pursues Trayvon in his car and then eventually gets out and confronts him, even though the police dispatch he called specifically instructed him not to approach Trayvon at all. Zimmerman chases Trayvon, and when he catches them, when he catches him, the two of them struggle, and then Zimmerman shoots and kills Trayvon Martin. He admits to this immediately when police arrive. Trayvon was unarmed, and it's clear from the 911 transcripts that Zimmerman instigated the encounter. And yet, Zimmerman isn't charged with any crime. Police take his statement, 
and they let him go home. And it's during the six weeks that Zimmerman goes uncharged that this killing becomes national news. It wasn't just that Zimmerman shot Trayvon. It was that he had done it, admitted to it, and been allowed to walk free. Why did Zimmerman go uncharged for a month and a half? Well, there are a lot of ways that the killing of black people has been excused and legitimized. But one reason was that Zimmerman was able to invoke a new Florida law called Stand Your Ground, a law that was created in 2005 with the support of, NR of the NRA and major gun retailers and is now law in some form in 33 states. Stand Your Ground basically extends what is called the Castle Doctrine, since basically the beginning of its existence, the United States has had a version of the Castle Doctrine, as in a man's home is his castle, which is adapted from English common law. It essentially says that if there's an intruder in your home, you are allowed to kill that person even if it's possible for you to escape. A century ago, Judge Benjamin Cardozo, who became a Supreme Court Justice, described the Castle Doctrine like this. A man, if assailed at home, may stand his ground and resist the attack. He is under no duty to take to the fields and the highways a fugitive in his own home. What Stand Your Ground did was widely expand the Castle Doctrine. Under Stand Your Ground, anyone who is attacked, anywhere he or she is lawfully present, has, quote, no duty to retreat and has the right to stand his or her ground and meet force with force, including deadly force, if he or she reasonably believes that it is necessary to do so to prevent great death or bodily harm. So before, the Castle Doctrine allowed lethal force to protect people inside their own homes. Now, in states that have passed Stand Your Ground, we allow it wherever someone is legally present. Your castle is now anywhere that you happen to be, and your reasonable belief in your own danger can justify killing another person. But is this reasonable belief standard race neutral? Let's look at some of the data. This chart shows how likely it is that a killing will be deemed justified based on the race of the shooter and the victim, using white on white killings as the zero baseline. So on the left, a black person killing a black person is less likely to be seen as justified, and a black person killing a white person is far less likely to be seen as justified compared to a white person who kills a white person. But as you can see from the data on the far right, when whites kill black people, they're two and a half times more likely to be seen as justified. And in Stand Your Ground states, which is now well over half of America, which is the purple bar, the tall purple bar on the right, that number is even bigger. Whites are three and a half times more likely to be found justified if they kill a black person instead of a white one. So put in the language of the law itself, White on black killings in stand your ground states are significantly more likely to be seen as stemming from a reasonable fear, the kind of fear that George Zimmerman invoked after he chased, confronted, and killed an unarmed Trayvon Martin. Now, legally, stand your ground was not supposed to be part of Zimmerman's defense at trial because both sides agreed that the details of the physical struggle between him and Trayvon made the law inapplicable. But it didn't need to be in order to serve its purpose. The media talked so much about stand your ground as a mitigating factor, and the defense used the phrase stand your ground repeatedly during argument. So it appears that jurors, whose racial biases were no different than anyone else's, were confused and apparently used the racially inflected logic of stand your ground anyway. After the verdict, one juror told CNN that the jury did acquit Zimmerman in part because of stand your ground, which exposed a shocking misunderstanding of the law's role in the case but a keen sense of its role in our society. One of the more tragic ironies of this killing is that while Trayvon fell victim in Sanford to one kind of criminalization, he was actually there in part to escape another kind of criminalization. Trayvon didn't live primarily in Sanford. He lived and went to school in Miami, four hours south. The night he was killed was Sunday. It was a school night. But Trayvon was in Sanford with his father because he had been suspended from school and didn't need to be back in Miami the next morning. The suspension that led Trayvon to stay in Sanford with his dad was his third of the year. His first was for tardiness. His second was for writing the acronym WTF on a locker. And his third was for possessing a bag that had marijuana residue on it. Now, 
This might seem to you to be cut and dry. Trayvon broke the rules and so he was suspended. And his suspension was often cited in the media as proof of troubled behavior. But it's quite a bit more ambiguous than that. Crop High, Trayvon's school, has detailed guidelines for which offenses warrant which types of punishment. Now, these guidelines themselves are quite draconian, but even if we set that aside for now, it's clear from the details of, excuse me, of Trayvon's suspensions that he was treated unfairly even by his school's own standards. On the table behind me, there are three columns. On the left is Trayvon's offense. In the center is the punishment that the offense warrants according to Crop High's own guidelines. And on the right is the punishment that Trayvon actually got. As you can see, Trayvon's first two offenses shouldn't have resulted in suspensions at all. For his third, he got the maximum suspension for an offense that appears to be one of the least serious drug offenses possible. So by punishing him excessively and against established rules, the school created a pattern of offenses which snowballed and then justified a stiff penalty for the one actual offense. Now, the tricky thing about looking at systemic racism through the lens of one student's suspensions is that there's obviously a lot of ambiguity and subjectivity involved. We can say for sure that Trayvon's first two suspensions weren't warranted by the school's own guidelines, but there may be additional context that we simply don't know about. But when we put Trayvon in a larger context, we see some worrisome patterns. Since the 1970s, the percentage of students suspended from school has doubled, and black students have been suspended disproportionately. Today, Black students are suspended at three times the rate of white students and twice as often as Latinx students. The most heavily suspended students are black, male, and disabled. And black students aren't just over suspended, they're also judged more punitively for the same exact behavior compared to their peers of other races. In Okaloosa County, where CROP is located, Roughly 50% of school arrests involve black students, even though they make up only 12% of the school population. At CROP, specifically, the data is similar. Nearly 50% of CROP suspensions are given to black students, who account for under a quarter of the student body as a whole. Trayvon's suspensions were discussed ad nauseum in the media, but almost always as legitimate, and an examination of his character, not an examination of the school, its policies, and his treatment by the adults around him. This is one of the key ways systemic racism works. It posits that racial disparities are the product not of systems, but of black individual behavior, and then primes people to search for evidence of behavior that can account for the disparity. This erasure of the workings of systemic racism and the use of behaviorally focused racial stereotyping were present all in all of the other issues that I've talked to you about today. Let's look at some of the headlines from stories about the case to get a sense of the pattern. So NBC says Trayvon Martin suspended from school three times. New York Magazine, FBI sources say George Zimmerman isn't a racist, whatever that means. Um, USA Today, Trayvon Martin, typical teen or troublemaker? CBS, George Zimmerman used a racial slur in a bar once. And the New York Times says the defense in the Trayvon Martin case raises questions about the victim's character. All of these headlines draw our attention to questions of individual behavior as a way of explaining what happened. And they draw our attention away from important racially discriminatory forces and perceptions. What I hope I've conveyed today is that Trayvon Martin's death was the product of much more than what People Magazine called a chance encounter. It was the product of systemic racism in three key areas. In housing, it was the product of racialized fears about crime and neighborhood prosperity. In criminal justice, it was the product of a legal logic which legitimized the killing and demonized the victim. And in schools, it was the product of the racially targeted application of draconian school policy. The micro-level interpersonal details of these cases do, of course, matter. But the way we've explained what happened to Trayvon Martin hides how systemic racism works and the damage it does. Thank you.